Our Father, we thank you that you have a plan, a plan for the ages, a plan that cannot be thwarted, that cannot be stopped, a plan that is infinitely the best plan possible. It is a plan that is being worked out daily. It's on schedule. It's more exact than an atomic clock. It will culminate when the Lord Jesus returns. It's right there at the end of Revelation. And in the interim, until he returns, and we long for his return, we don't know when that will be. We are closer today to it than we were yesterday. But we are going through life day by day. And we see things that discourage us and we th see things that at times threaten to overwhelm us and it seems as though evil is prevailing and it seems like the gospel is being diminished and that the plan is not being achieved, it's not being worked out. But it is being worked out. You work sovereignly, you work strangely, you work slowly, but you work. And this plan involves all generations for all time. It's eternal. And here we are alive on the earth for 70, 80, maybe 90 years. And we're a part of that plan. But there are billions of people on the earth and you weave all of those people and their existence and their lives and the nations in which they live and their kings and their rulers and the wars and the rumors of wars, you weave it all together and every day your plan marches on. And it's a good plan. And often we can't see it and we wonder what you're up to. What we're looking at is the back side of the tapestry, not the front side. Not the beautiful scene that has been woven, but we're looking at the backside, which is full of threads, loose threads, loose ends. There's no rhyme or reason to it. There's all the difference in the world in looking at the backside of a tapestry and the front. And where we are right now, we don't see everything. We don't have all the pieces of information, although we are inundated with information that is false, that is deceptive. We're lied to constantly. So this is why we come and we open our Bibles. Because your word is truth. And Jesus said, if you abide in my word, if you continue in my word, then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. This is why we're here tonight. We pray that you'll give us clarity. We pray that you'll give us hope. We pray that you'll open our eyes so that we can see things perhaps that we haven't seen. Because we've been looking from the wrong perspective. We need hope, and your word gives us hope. You give us hope. Christ is our hope. So minister to us. Encourage us. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And of all people on the earth, we are the ones who should be joyful, even in the midst of what's going on right now. Because you're in charge and you're calling the shots. We thank you for this truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're continuing our study in Daniel. We're calling, calling this study Courage in Chaos. And uh, yes, indeed, the chaos continues. It, uh, 
every, every day is interesting. Every day you think to yourself, well, man, I mean, this is crazy. It can't get any crazier, and then later that day it's more crazy. It's just where we are. And as we look into the scripture, and we look particularly at Daniel and his three friends and the chaos that took place in their life because of the sins of the nation, refusing to listen to God for uh, hundreds of years, going after idols. They were taken into captivity in 506 B.C. The Lord gave the nation of Judah to Nebuchadnezzar, it says in the first chapter of Daniel. And they were taken into captivity for 70 years. So we have been looking at Daniel because the book of Daniel is a book for our time. It's, it's a book that has tremendous relevance to where we are right now. It, it was a chaotic time for Daniel and his friends and for all the people that were taken into exile. It's a chaotic time for us because the things that have always been in place are uh, under attack, are being threatened, our, our lives as, as we have, I mean, in my lifetime, and I'm sure you're right there with me, we haven't seen anything like this, but it's where we are. And what we need is courage to keep going and to keep trusting the Lord. We want stability, we want uh, our feet firmly planted on God's truth. We want to stand firm as others are fainting. This is a time where, um, where we need to be courageous. And, and what strange times they are. So, what, what this is... Um, I, I almost want to say, I want this tonight to kind of be like a, a fireside chat. But um, I don't have a fire. And a lot of you guys have masks on, which makes it really difficult to chat. But let's just kind of take it as a fireside chat. I, I, want, to, I want to take a step back just a little bit. And we did this last week. But I want to take a step back and just sort of consider from Scripture, again, what's going on, what our perspective should be. And I, I think I've said this every week this fall, that every week I'm talking to guys who are stressed. That's the word, stressed, overly stressed, stressed out. Trying to handle the stress, trying to cope with the stress, trying to uh, get perspective and uh, not lose heart. So last night, I'm watching Amy Coney Barrett be sworn in by Justice Thomas to the Supreme Court. I was going to watch the World Series, but it wasn't on. So that upped my stress. And I'm just sort of, you know, and they're interviewing different people, what are the ramifications and all that. So I start just checking my phone to see some responses, check some websites I hadn't checked that day. And I came across a article that referred to a tweet that Hillary Clinton posted, if you post a tweet, uh, she did a tweet on October 26 of 2016. Now yesterday was October 26 of 2020. So I had just seen Amy Coney Barrett sworn in. I'm reading this article I said, what's this about? A tweet she did four years ago? And four years ago yesterday, she did a tweet congratulating herself 
this, you can't make this up. This is not the Babylon Bee. This is true. She, made a t- she tweeted to herself a happy birthday wish. It was her birthday, October 26th. Happy birthday. And then there was a picture from her third or fourth or fifth grade class, her class picture, you know, little girl, uh, prominently featured. Happy birthday to the next president of the United States. She tweeted congratulations to herself just a week or so before the election. Um, And I had just watched, and it was four years later to the day, Amy Coney Barrett sworn into the Supreme Court. And I think it's a fair thing to say if Hillary was president, she probably would not have appointed Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. But Amy Coney Barrett was being installed, and Hillary Clinton was on the sidelines. And I thought, that's what we talked about last week at Bible study. That's Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epics the times and the seasons. It is he who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. And then I read another article about Hillary as I'm still sitting in the same place and they're still talking about the confirmation that had just taken place. And it indicated that she was still upset that she was not put in place, that she was not president in 2016. And she was interviewed, and Clinton said it makes her literally sick and would cause her cognitive dissonance of a grave degree. Who talks like that? To imagine President Trump winning re-election. It makes me, here's a quote, it makes me literally sick to my stomach and to think that we'd have four more years of this abuse and destruction of our institutions. And I thought to myself, destruction of what institutions? Other than buildings and people's homes and people's businesses. Uh, Chuck Schumer said yesterday it was the darkest day in the history of the United States Senate. Now how can that be? It all depends on who your God is. You say, you know, you've been talking a lot of politics. Politics is who your God is. You can't can't, can't separate politics from who is your God. And who your God is determines your politics. And it determines your policies and it determines your morality. She went on and said, it's a damaging of our norms and our values. Well, God help us. But see, she's got a different God than what you've got right here. She does not acknowledge the moral law of Almighty God. She acknowledges another law. But it's not the law of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the law of Scripture. It's not the righteousness of God. It's not the holiness of God. She then went on to say that Republicans have been cowards, spineless enablers. And then interview Kara Swisher also asked Clinton if she thought a female president would have handled the pandemic better. I have no doubt, especially if it were me, replied Clinton. 
I have no doubt. I mean, I was born for that. Actually, she wasn't born for it. She just thinks she is. If she was born for it, she'd be in. But she wasn't born for it. She just yearned for it. As we said last week, um, we're going to vote. Perhaps you've already voted. I've already voted. There's room for a lot of folks to vote here. We vote, we go ahead and vote, but God makes the choice. Um, you have, what, what we're going to do here in a minute is that I'm going to springboard from this passage in Daniel, and I'm going to springboard to the book of Esther. And because the book of Esther is another demonstration of these verses in Daniel. When we get to Esther, we're going to see three things. And this, if you have a ESV study Bible, this is in their introduction. In the book of Esther, you're going to see the sovereignty of God, that God's in absolute control, He's in absolute charge of all things. We talk about all, that all the time, and we should. Secondly, you're going to be, see human responsibility. Yes, God's in charge, and God has all control, but God has given us a will. He has created us. He offers us wisdom, and he wants us to listen to his wisdom rather than the wisdom of the world so that we can make good choices because we're responsible for our choices, and we will give an account for our choices. And if we make right choices, we can go God's way and have God's favor and blessing. We make wrong choices, we're going against him, and we'll, we'll be judged, and we'll, we will be uh, reprimanded in God's timing and in different ways as we go through life. And the longer you go against God, the harder your heart becomes, so that's the wrong path. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. We were on that path before we came to know Christ. Now we're after the wisdom of God. So you have, but, but we're, st we're making choices every day. And we choose every morning, am I going to follow Christ or I'm going to follow what I want? That's why Paul said, I die daily. I die daily to what I would desire. I die daily to what I think is best. He's my Lord. He's my master. He's my shepherd. He's my God. I follow him. The third thing that we're going to see in Esther is the insanity of evil men and their plans. The insanity of evil men and their plans. So, Daniel 2, verses 20 to 21. I also want to turn to Proverbs 16, 18 in light of Hillary's comments. In, in, Proverbs, in Proverbs 16, 18, and we're, and we're familiar with this concept. It says this. It says... Now remember what Hillary had to say. I'm going to quote this again. Would we better, would, would, she was asked if she thought a female president would have handled the pandemic better. I have no doubt, especially if it were me. I have no doubt. I mean, I was born for that. Okay. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit a high spirit before stumbling. Uh, pride is uh, the greatest of all the sins. Pride thinks we know what's best. Pride revolves around us and what we want. Pride elevates our judgment. Pride elevates our uh, discernment. Pride makes us God. 
It makes us want to be God in our lives and in the lives of others, which is the root of communism and socialism. You want control over everything, including everyone else in the world. They should bow to you. When you talk about sovereignty, you also have to talk about God's providence, that God is not only in control of all things, but that God rules over all things. Uh, you've heard that some of the founding fathers, and it's true, some of them were deist. Deists believe that God just uh, created things, kind of wound the clock, and then took his hands off and went about his business and not involved in the daily affairs, not involved in the details, not involved in the world and people's lives. That is the exact opposite of what scripture teaches. So here's a book I've read maybe 50 times called The Mystery of Providence by John Flavel, uh, a pastor in Dartmouth, England. Uh, the, the Puritans, they get a bad rap, but the thing about the Puritans, the Puritans were men in England, they, they wanted to purify the church. And they were hated for it, and they went through great persecution. In 1662, there was an edict um, in England that all of the Bible-believing pastors um, were forbidden to preach in their churches. And they were put out of their churches. And they were given a stipend by the government. That's how they lived. And they couldn't go within five miles of a church because uh, they were preaching the gospel. And they were not going along with the bureaucracy and the hierarchy and all of that. These guys paid a great price. Um, he wrote this book, The Mystery of Providence. It's based on one verse in the Bible. It's very small print. It is based on Psalm 57, 2, where David was surrounded by, by Saul's army. He was uh, hiding in the caves, and he was burrowed in, and Saul's hundreds and hundreds of soldiers were trying to find him. And this went on for probably 10 years. He was on the run. And as he is surrounded by these soldiers trying to kill him, in Psalm 57, 2, David says, I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performs all things for me. He will sin from heaven and save me. This whole book is based on that verse. Now, other verses are pulled in, <clears throat> but that's the root verse. I will cry unto God most high. And Flavel just, this is... This is a remarkable book. You can't read too many pages at one sitting. It's like a rich dessert. I, I mean, you, you can only take so much. And then you got to walk away and digest it, and you got to ponder it, and you got to think about it. But um, I will cry unto God most high. And he talks about David's situation, and Saul was the king, and Saul was jealous. And Saul knew that because of his disobedience, the Lord was against him, was going to take the kingdom away, and David was going to get it. So he has this insane motivation to destroy David, and he's pursuing him all over Israel. And he can't get him. He can't catch him. And David's under great affliction. He's under great persecution. And one of the points that Flavel makes is that God puts rulers in place at times that are against him and against his word and against his law. And they have a certain amount of power that they have been given. And if they're good rulers, they can bless our lives. If they're evil rulers, they bring difficulty into our lives. But God oversees it all. And if there's difficulty and there's evil, God is the one who takes evil and turns it for our good. But Flavel makes the point 
that yes, there are rulers and they are high, and we think that because of their power, they determine our destiny and they determine our future and the future of our children and the future of our grandchildren. But he makes the point, he said, I grant you they are high, but he is most high. Now see, that's, that's a jewel you don't want to lose. They're high, he's most high. You don't want to lose that right now. There are rulers, they're high. Depending on what state you're in, you can't breathe because of the bureaucratic restrictions. If you're in California, you've heard this at Thanksgiving, only three people can get together for Thanksgiving. That's in the Constitution of the United States. Oh, no, it isn't. It's in somebody's heart who loves power and thinks they're God. See, right there, that lowers my blood pressure. They're high. He's most high. He owns them. He runs them. He controls them. He puts them in. He takes them out. Just one quote from Flavel in regard to God's providence, which is the providence of God is that God is in control of all things, good and bad, leaf and blade, weed and flower, rain and drought. He's in charge of it all. Uh, it's the providence of God. He, uh, writing of the providence of God, he speaks of the timing of providence. And he says this. He's speaking of the events of life, and he is speaking of um, the affairs of government and rulers in our lives and when evil men are in charge. And then he goes on and says, if these things are contingent... How is it that they fall out so remarkably just in the nick of time? Which makes them so greatly observable to all that consider them. He's talking about when things are against you and there's no way out and there's no escape. You're at the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army is behind you and there's mountains on either side and you got to Massive amount of water, and there's just no escape. But then suddenly there is a way of escape. And how many times do you see that in Scripture? This is what he's talking about. He says, we find a multitude of providences so timed to a minute that had they occurred just a little sooner or later, they had really, they had mattered little in comparison with what now they do. Certainly, it cannot be chance, but counsel, the counsel of God that so exactly works in time. Contingencies keep no rules. Um, he talks about a group of believers in France back during a time of persecution around the Reformation. He says, how remarkable was the relief of La Rochelle by a, sh by a shoal of fish that came into the harbor when they were ready to perish with famine. You had a group of believers that were on the run. They were starving to death. They're at the seacoast, and this school of fish come in, and they were able to catch them. They were able to pull them in, and they were able to cook them, eat them, feed them to their kids, and that school of fish had never been seen before or since. He goes on and talks about another man that was on the run from persecution from the bureaucratic authorities, and he's escaping for his life. He's running in and out of the streets. He, he's, he's making headway. He sees a large outdoor oven that's not in use, kind of like a big igloo pizza oven. There's enough of an opening. He goes in, 
And as he goes in, a spider immediately begins to weave a web over the entrance. Within a few minutes, the soldiers come. They're looking. One soldier gets close, looks, sees the web, and immediately leaves. Because there's no possible way someone's in there because there's a spider web, and if the guy had gone in, you get it. That's the providence of God. I love this book. Because it lets you see just how deeply involved God is in the details of our lives. So even, let's go back to last night. I'm watching Amy Coney Barrett being confirmed. And then I'm checking my phone and I'm, you know, reading Hillary's tweets and shaking my head. And then I had had, I brought in some mail and it was next to me on the couch and I had ordered from Amazon a book by Senator Ted Cruz called One Vote Away. And it just came out a few weeks ago. And I started looking at it and he, you know, talked about, he opens the book by talking about where he was when he got the phone call that Justice Scalia had died in his sleep. And then he went on to talk about the importance of the Supreme Court. He had clerked at the Supreme Court under Rehnquist. And uh, he, he said, this election of 2020, this election of 2020 is so critical because we're just one seat away from losing our democracy. We're one seat away from losing freedom. We're one seat away. And I'm looking at Amy Coney Barrett on the screen. And I just started laughing. Because you see, the timing of God is exquisite. It's exquisite. John Flavel in here somewhere says, learn to adore the providence of God. So Cruz talks about the death of Scalia. He wrote this book many months ago. This is why we're going to Esther. I just want to show you out of Esther in our little fireside chat. So does everyone have their cocoa and your marshmallows and your Bible? Please don't spill it. Just enjoy this. I want to kind of helicopter through Esther. Now, a little bit of context. Esther, um, there, there's a king in here called Ahasuerus. He is the grandson of Cyrus. Cyrus was the one that the Lord used after the Jews had been in captivity for 70 years. Cyrus was the one that God spoke to 150 years before he was born and said, even though you don't know me, you're my anointed. And I'm going to use you. And I'm going to put within you a heart to help my people and to fund their return to Jerusalem and to fund the construction. Many of the Jews had gone back, but some had remained in certain uh, countries uh, where they had been exiled and they were still there. So I want to helicopter the book of Esther. And the reason I want to do this is because, once again, I want to return to this idea of stress. This is a time of high stress. I don't want to belabor the point too strongly, but we got an election coming up in seven days, and we may or may not know what the results are. But this is a high stress time and you've got stuff from COVID and maybe it's affected your business and maybe you're trying to make payroll or maybe you're just trying to meet your bills this month or whatever. But you add in the normal things of life, health issues, maybe you couldn't get treatment because of COVID and all. You add all that stuff in and then on top of it, as one guy recently said to me, on top of it, there's the election. So we're stressed and we're overstressed, as we said last week. 
This book, once again, will um, give you hope, and this book will give you uh, peace. It, it will encourage your heart. So I'm going to helicopter the book. So in Esther chapter 1, what we've got going on here is, is that uh, Hashuerus calls a great banquet, and he's a very powerful king. He calls a great banquet, and he's got you know, leaders from all of his countries and kingdoms there. And what he wants to do is he wants his queen to come out and make an appearance. If you look at verse 11, he gives a command to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal uh, crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princes, for she was beautiful. Verse 12, but Queen Vashti refused. She had read a book that had just come out on feminism, and she just decided, I'm not doing this. For whatever her reasons were, she wasn't going to do it. She wasn't, now this guy was her husband, but he was also the king. And back then, the kings had absolute power. I mean, if you looked at them wrong, they'd take your head off, literally, and Esther's going to face that herself. If you go down to verse 19, this, this was such a, um, a breach of how things were done that, well, 19, if it pleases the king, his advisors say, let a royal edict be issued by him and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media so that it cannot be repealed that Vashti may no longer come into the presence of King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is more worthy than she. So Vashti is out. My point is, in Esther 1, there is an unplanned vacancy. Now, I'm going to let you make some application. It's always amazing to me how relevant the Word of God is. So, you don't have a death here. You have a dismissal. But there's an unplanned vacancy. By the way, Daniel 2, he removes kings, he sets them up. That's true of any leader. It's true of any powerful politician. He removes kings. He removes queens. He sets up queens. He removes prime ministers. He sets them up. Congressmen, speakers of the house, you name it, God's in control. God's in charge of all nations, of all governments, of all rulers. So there was an unplanned vacancy. Then you get into Esther 2, and we're going to find, and this is, this is the wonderful thing about God, and you see this throughout the scripture. Psalm 75 says, promotion comes not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the desert. Promotion comes from God. Demotion also comes from God. He raises up one, and he sets down another. You see this throughout Scripture. Whenever there is a crisis, whenever there is a vacuum of leadership and God's people are threatened, God always has someone that he has prepared quietly waiting in the wings. Just waiting, not seeking it, not going after it. They've been tested, they've been proven in the wilderness, in prison, through suffering, through hardship, and he has them ready to step into the public eye because he has prepared them in private. And God, oh, whenever there's a crisis, God's got someone to step in. That's what he did with Daniel. That's what he did with Moses. That's what he did with Joseph. Joseph. There's going to be a famine. Who's going, to, who's going to administrate? Who's going to rule over this? Well, since God's revealed to you, you're going to do it. God's always got to, he's, God's, God's never lacking a solution, ever. And we're going to see that here in chapter 2. 
So God's replacement is ready and waiting. We meet two people, Mordecai and Esther. Verse 5, now there was at the citadel in Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai. He was a Kish, a Benjamite, who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives. Verse 7, he was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. So he was an older cousin to Esther. She had no father or mother. We don't know what happened to them. They, they were not on the scene. They obviously passed away. Now, the young lady was beautiful of form and face. When her father and mother died, uh, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So he had raised her. Uh, the king is going to start looking for a replacement for Vashti. And so they gather these, a group of young women to go into the king, and he is going to choose one as his queen. But in verse 10 of 2, it says, Esther did not make known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. Every day, Mordecai walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and how she fared. So he's very tuned in. He's concerned. He knows she's in a difficult position. And uh, he's always been there for her, and he has a love for her, and he's available to her. So he's, he's protecting her. He's watching out for her. That's what good dads do. That's what good uncles do. So there's sort of this contest, and the king is going to pick one. Well, you get to verse 17. The king loved Esther more than all the women. And she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. There's your promotion. The king gave a great banquet. 19, when the virgins were gathered together, the second time that Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Esther had not yet made her kindred or her people uh, known, even as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther did what Mordecai told her as she had done one under his care. So, what you have in 17 is that Esther is sworn in. She's going to be the new queen. Now, it gets interesting because in 21, there's an assassination plot that Mordecai discovers. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's officials from those who guarded the door, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. But the plot became known to Mordecai. He told Queen Esther, Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Now when the plot was investigated and found to be so, they were both hanged on a gallows and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. Uh, apparently one of these two guys uh, left his laptop in uh, Mordecai's shop <laughs> And it signed a waiver, and after 45 days, Mordecai could check it out. And, I mean, it's, it's an amazing story. Um, uh, you know, actually, that's another story. That, that's not in here. But may I say to you about the laptop, the laptop situation? That, too, is under the providence of God. Ephesians 1.11, he works all things after the counsel of his will. All things. God is in the details. The devil is not in the details. God is in the details. It's the providence of God. So, Mordecai alerts the king. It's written in the Chronicles in the king's presence. Now you get to three. And now in three, we're going to meet a wicked enemy. His name is Haman. After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. So now this guy has authority over the entire bureaucracy. This guy's a bad dude. He's evil. And he's got an evil plan. 
All the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why are you transgressing the king's command? Now, it was when they had spoken daily to him and he would not listen to them that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, he was filled with rage. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Now watch this. For they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai who were throughout the whole kingdom of the Hashuaris. So now, this guy who was wicked, I'm not only going to kill Mordecai, I'm going to kill every Jew on the face of the earth. And he had the power to do it. Now, what's the big deal? Why is this guy so upset? Well, do you remember in the Old Testament, there was an event where Moses was leading the people and the rear guard was attacked and this battle was going on and on and uh, Aaron and Hur would hold up the hands of Moses. And as long as his hands were up, Israel would win the battle. But when he was fatigued and his hands went down, the others would win the battle. Those were the ancestors of Haman. They were enemies of Israel. And they were such enemies that God told, I won't go into the details here, but God told Saul to destroy them, and he didn't destroy them. And there was this thing going on for a thousand years of, of a... You talk about warfare between two groups of people. This is why Mordecai would not bow down, because there was a long history. So there's this conspiracy. He's not only going to kill Mordecai, and believe me, he's got the power to do it. And not only does he have the power, he has the money to pull off his plan. So you get to verse 8. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdoms. Their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. If you, um, if you believe in the principles of the scripture, if you believe in the moral law of God, if you believe in the principles that are in the Constitution, um, there is a movement to destroy you. And that's not an overstatement. If you, if you just look up the statements being made, in fact, one of the tech oligarchs made a statement several years ago that on the next election, it's going to be different. And those who stand in our way, we're going to destroy those reprobates. He meant Bible-believing Christians. He meant anyone who believes in the Constitution of this United States. See, depending on who your God is, you got a different moral code. Watch this, verse 9. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. I will pay 10,000 talents of silver. By the way, the national budget of the Hashuaris was 15,000. This was a lot of money. So, king, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay you a lot of money. You're the big man. You're the big guy. You're going to get your cut. And uh, the king signs off. In 11, the king said to Haman, the silver is yours and the people also to do with them as you please. Okay. Any of this um, ringing a bell? I, I, maybe, maybe not. So then they sent out letters in 13 to the entire kingdom, to all the nations that, um, well, let's just read it. 
Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children, and one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to seize their possessions as plunder. Uh, the couriers went out, 15, impelled by the king's command, while the decree was issued at the citadel in Susa, and while the king and Haman sat down to drink, the city of Susa was in confusion. I mean, this was bad news, this was bad stuff. The Jews were good citizens, and suddenly, their nick's on the line. All, they're all going to be killed in a matter of months. Four, chapter four, when Mordecai learned all this had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out in the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. What you have here is Mordecai's despair because he believes he's the cause of this because he wouldn't bow down. But he shouldn't have bowed down. You see? And what he does is Esther finds out that he's at the gates, he's in despair, sends her guy to find out what's going on. In 8, he gave the messenger a copy of the text of the edict which had been issued in Susa for the destruction that he might show Esther and inform her and to order her to go into the king to implore his favor and to plead with him for her people. Now, Esther's got a decision. Is she going to be a coward or is she going to show courage? Because the problem is you just couldn't go in to see the king. If you went in to see the king without being summoned, it could cost you your head. 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's, and this is Esther's reply, all the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that for any man or woman who comes to the king in the inner court who is not summoned, he has but one law, that he be, be, be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. Then Mordecai told them, 13, to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. In other words, you have this great life, you have this promotion, you're not just there for your personal fulfillment and happiness. You've been put there for such a time as this. Because you see, we're living our lives, but God knows what crises are coming. And we go through stuff, and we go through hardships, and through many uh, tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God, and God is taking us, and at times our hearts are broken, and we're in despair, and we don't think we can go on, and we wonder where the goodness of God is but he's building spiritual muscle in our lives because he is preparing us for something down the road we have absolutely no idea about. But when you get there, you have a sense, and you're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to be a coward? Or I'm going to trust the living God and be courageous? She makes the right, cho she makes the right choice because she tells him in 16, go assemble all the Jews... Fast for me, don't eat, drink for three days. I'll do the same with my maidens. And I'll go in to see the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. There's courage in chaos. It only comes from Almighty God. Because if you know, if you know that your life is in his hands, and it is far better to be with the Lord, you don't have to fear death. Is that not right? I mean, you're going to die anyway, right? Right? I mean, you're going to die. It's just a matter of how you're going to die. But you can't die until your work is done. Now you get into five. And she goes in to see the king. And puts her life on the line. And he grants her favor. And he says in verse three of five, what's troubling you? What's your request? Even half the kingdom shall be given to you. She says, if it pleases the king, may you come to a banquet I have prepared this day. With Haman, the king says, bring Haman quickly. And um, Haman's invited. And he wants to know what the request is. The king does. Eight, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and do what I request, may the king and Haman come to the banquet, which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I'll do as the king says. In other words, I'll let you know tomorrow what my request is. Fine. So now, here's Haman. And I'll tell you what. Nobody else was invited except the king. 
and Haman, and he puffs up with pride like a toad. Then Haman went out that day and pleased of heart. Why? Well, he's in the in club. I mean, he's got a platinum card. He's got access to the king. He's going to the, no one else is going in there. But when King, but when Haman, I mean, he's thrilled. When Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that Haman did not stand or tremble before him, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. Watch the pride of this guy. Haman controlled himself, went to his house, sent for his friends and his wife, Zeresh. Then Haman recounted to them the glory of his riches and the number of his sons and every instance where the king had magnified him and how he had promoted him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman also said, even Esther the queen, let no one but me come with the king to the banquet which she had prepared and tomorrow I'm also invited by her with the king. You, yet all of this does not satisfy me every time I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then Zeresh, his wife, and all the friends said to him, Have a gallows fifty cubits high made, and in the morning ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go, joy, then go joyfully to the banquet. And the advice pleased Haman. So he had the gallows made. This is bad news. I mean, it's on, it's on cable, it's on all the news sites, it's on everything. It's overwhelmingly bad news. I mean, there's no way out. You guys still with me? Uh, apply this stuff over the next week. Apply it. What did we learn last week from Jehoshaphat? The, the, the overwhelming hordes of the army of three nations coming against him. He says we are powerless to stop them. There is nothing we can do but our eyes are upon you. And the prophet sent by the Lord says, the battle is not yours, it is the Lord's. Stand by and watch the Lord fight. And the next day they went out, and God had confused the three armies, and they'd slaughtered each other, and all they did was get the plunder. But see things, I mean, it's horrible. I mean, the gallows and... In the morning, that's it for Mordecai, except for the sovereignty of God and the providence of God and the power of God over kings. God's always given these kings dreams. He freaks these suckers out. Or he interrupts their sleep. Or he, because you see Proverbs 21, 1, the king's heart is like channels in the water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it whatever way he wishes. Six, this is called, did you see the movie Sleepless in Seattle? This is sleepless in Susa. <laughs> during the night, during that night, that night, between the two banquets, during that night, the king couldn't sleep, so he gave an order to bring the book of records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. It was found, written, a guy can't sleep. There's no TV. Hey, bring me the book. Let's, let me read some. So as he's reading, it was found that Mordecai had reported concerning Bigthana and Teresh to the king's eunuchs, who were the doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. The king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's servants uh, said, nothing has been done for him. The king said, well, who's in the court? Now watch this. You talk about providence. You talk about the timing of God, which is impeccable. Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace in order to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows, which he had prepared for him. The king's servant said to him, Behold, Haman is standing in the court. The king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king desire to honor more than me? There's your pride. Haman <clears throat> had a plan to be honored by the king. Then Haman said to the king, Here's Haman's answer. Well, for the man whom the king desires to honor, let them bring a royal robe which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown has been placed, and let the robe and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble princes, and let them array the man whom the king desires to honor, and lead him on horseback through the city square, and proclaim before him, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. In other words, get one of your lackey bureaucrats, and let him lead this guy through, and, and announce honor upon him, thinking it's him. 
Then the king said to Haman, Take quickly the robes and the horse of you said, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who was sitting at the king's gate. Do not fall short in anything of all that you have said. So Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed, arrayed Mordecai, led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried home, mourning with his head covered, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Haman recounted to Zeresh, his wife and all his friends, everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and Zeresh said to him, if Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of Jewish origin, you will not overcome him, but you will surely fall before him. And while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hastily brought Haman to the banquet which the king had prepared. And it's at the banquet in seven where the king says, Esther, what is it that you desire? I'll give you half the kingdom. And what she says is, verse four, we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed and to be killed and to be annihilated. Five, Ahasuerus said to Esther, who is he and where is he who would presume to do this? Esther said, a foe and an enemy is this wicked, Haman. Haman became terrified before the king and queen. Uh, the king goes out in the garden. Haman uh, is trying to persuade Esther, falls on the couch where she was. The king comes in, will he assault me? Will he assault the queen even with me in the house? Nine. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs who were before the king, said, Behold, indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai. And the king's anger subsided. In eight, Haram's house and assets are given to Mordecai. And then in eight, he says to Esther and Mordecai, now you write to the Jews as you see fit for the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For a decree which is written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's signet ring may not be revoked. And this goes to the entire nation. If you look at nine, it extends to India and Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to every province according to its script and to every people according to their language, as well to the Jews, according to their script and their language. In 11, the king granted the Jews who were in each and every city the right to assemble and to defend their lives, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the entire army of any people or province which might attack them, including children and women, to plunder their spoil. There was a plan. It was to be, this was time sensitive, and this plan of destruction was going to kick in in a particular month. But instead of it kicking in, the providence of God kicked in. 9 1. Now, in the 12th month, that is the month Adar, on the 13th day when the king's command and edict were about to be executed, on the day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, it was turned to the contrary so that the Jews themselves gained the mastery over those who hated them. It's the deliverance of the Jews. Um, if you read the book of Esther, I don't care how many times you will read it, you will never see the name of God in this book. That's unusual. Every other book in the Bible has God's name everywhere. But God's name is not in this book. But his fingerprints and his DNA are all over it. I, I would encourage you to take a step back and just look over the past weeks and see what God has done. Note the unexpected vacancy. Note the person prepared waiting in the wings. Note 
note the quality of life and virtue and intelligence, and um, they couldn't touch her. They couldn't touch her. Why? Because God's favor was upon her. I'll give you my opinion. I would grant you the election is critical, but I would submit to you that it's not quite as critical as it was because of the impeccable timing of God's providence. And will there be decisions coming up before that court that are significant? Yeah. The court has been politicized, as you know. That means they've got other gods. She's got the right God. And she's a member of a group that many evangelicals are a part of. She's not a Pelosi Catholic. She's not a Biden Catholic. She's a Jesus Catholic. The Catholics... The doctrine of the Catholic Church is ever-changing. Just notice the Pope's decree announcement this week that same-sex marriage is all right. 1 John 2 says, many antichrists have gone out among us. He's one of them. The Catholic Church believes you're justified by works. But there are people within the Catholic Church who know that's wrong, and they believe they're justified by grace alone, by Christ alone. God's at work. Don't be discouraged. The battle's not ours. The battle is the Lord's. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word, for your truth, for your encouragement. Thank you for the principles in this book. We, uh, we see great chaos and great confusion. But we name your name and we name the name of Jesus and we thank you that we have leaders that name the name of Jesus. You said those who honor me, them will I honor. And we thank you that your DNA and your fingerprints are all over this crisis and we pray that you will be glorified. That's our prayer that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray.